Phil Zadik, welcome to the podcast, sir. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Glad to be here. I'm excited. Looking forward to it. Now, let's start with, just want to congratulate you on the World Championship. Your first year, 2017, you guys won the world title. What does yeah. this one look like compared to 2017, and where have you seen Team USA grown since then? Um, well, it's it's uh, it's always super exciting when you can uh, be involved with uh, a, a championship level team. Uh, and you know, I was fortunate to uh, have been in a, a program with Coach Gable and and uh, saw how he um, led a program in in you know also a bunch of other successful coaches and and when you when you reach a pinnacle of what the team event or the team um concept of the sport uh, is i think it's something to really be celebrated and valued and, and and cherished and uh and so um when we won in 17 i was super excited it was uh you know, obviously my first year as a head coach, but that was an event that was a long time coming. You know, I was on staff for, um, you know, many years prior to that, uh, you know, started in January of 2009. And so um, up to 2017, you know, we're talking uh, a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Almost 10 years. And uh, it was a building process of, you know, culture, um, team atmosphere, perspective, vision, um, a lot of things coming together. And, and the reality is we have, um, we have unique athletes. We have a, we have a group of, a group of generational athletes. And I think we're at a point where, um, we have these guys that grew up as kids looking at the next level, you know, they, they were international minded freestyle, Greco folk style guys their whole lives in in looking to bigger and better things always in and, and now um you know we're at a point where uh we have a whole bunch of them on the team you yeah. know and and so winning winning again um you know it, it was really special um you know it was a great performance obviously there was a lot of markers made and and I know you know People are going to talk, well, the Russians weren't there and this and that and the other. But, but I mean, look at the markers, right? This team was going to perform well um, no matter who showed up. And, and, and uh, you know, hopefully next year we'll, we'll – maybe the Russians will be back in there and, and we'll see, you know, for us we're likely to have a different team. We haven't had the same team every year um, that I've been the head coach. There's always been, you know, and that's just the nature of the, of the game. But – um, I think program wide, we have a lot of great uh, minds in our sport, our college coaches and our RTCs that work really hard, our athletes that love what they're doing and they're passionate and they're professional about it and and they they make the right choices day in and day out and and so uh, yeah, twenty uh, you know twenty twenty two is a pretty special year and in. Uh, it's it's pretty exciting. It's pretty fun, um, you know. Just the fan in me of loving wrestling and being a part of this is is super exciting. Um, you know, the the wrestler, the competitor in me is, you know, hungry to win some more and, and do it again. Mm -hmm. and, and knowing that um, when you've done something, it's harder to do it the second and third and fourth times. And so we want to we want to keep innovating and and finding new ways to move forward and, and be successful. And, and uh, yeah, so. It's a great, uh, first of all, let me say, getting up every morning to watch, it was so much fun to watch your guys. And they wrestle with just such great pace. And, man, and I know it's it's you and all the other coaches, but, man, it is exciting to watch. And you look at this team, you know, you've had the, the great teams of the 72 and 76 era, right? Unbelievable teams mid nineties, great teams, this yeah. era, you know, it's, we're going to see a lot of change in 2024. So 17 to now it's like, you know, I love hearing you talk about how you have the potential to be one of these great teams. And like, we're watching them solidify themselves in history as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and even as you say that, right. And you kind of, uh, I've, I've used the same references, the same teams and the, and the men and, 
and athletes that were on those teams um, who are gone on to be leaders in our sport and leaders in society. And, but even just the timing, you know, I, I kind of find those things interesting. So you had, you know, roughly 20 to 25 years from the seventies to the nineties team, roughly about that same amount of time from then till now. And is it some kind of a, you know, I don't know that it means anything, right. But is there some kind of cyclical thing that can, can be learned from that? I don't know, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into it and, and yeah. see if there's, you know, any, any correlations there we're going to try to try to duplicate for sure. But um, yeah, these, these guys, um, they're a great team and they're fun to work with and it's fun. Um, you know, it, it's like I kind of said earlier is it's really fun when you have a culture of thought, we have a bunch of unique individuals, but we have a similar um, uh, culture of thought in, in how they want to approach things. And even, there's even, you know, a lot of idiosyncratic differences but I think there's a similar passion and a similar hunger to be successful and to find excellence, mm-hmm. and even though it's different in every person. And so that's really fun and really unique and challenging. And so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how, how this team shapes out the rest of this squad. And if uh, you know, I guess it will be folks like yourself that will look back and say, well, yeah, this team matches up to those <laughs> other eras or, or, or not, you know? Well, what I love about this team is that it's guys doing it three times, four times in the same team. Like that's just so rare to have one of those, like, you know, like, like a Kevin Jackson, a three timer. There's so many now in the same team. And it's like, you go into these tournaments just with such high expectations. It's a lot of pride because, you know, it hasn't always been that way. There's been some up and down years, but really re- recently it's been awesome. And You know, you think back to all the coaches you've been involved with, the Brands, the Gables, Sergey. What about Mark Sprague, though? Tell me about tell me about this guy and how this relationship started. Yeah, um, yeah, man, we don't have enough time to talk about Mark Sprague, honestly, (laughs) for the rest of this hour. But um, how'd you get introduced to him? So uh, I started wrestling in Montana. I was about five years old, and my dad. obviously was my coach and kind of led me, um, you know, my dad had wrestled and started late in life and he, he fell in love with it. Right. Was really passionate. And and to this day, um, you know, I don't know anybody that is as passionate as my father has been, um, in, in intensity, even coach Gable, coach Gable's intensity was a little bit different than, than my father's. Um, but my, my dad really loved it. And one of the things that he knew is he didn't know everything. And one of the, one of the great characteristics that he gave to us, my brother and I, but, but all the athletes that he coached was this hunger for learning. And so when I was getting started and started showing some aptitude and, and, and desire, you know, to have fun and be good at it, we started finding better people around us. And, and one of those uh, families was the Campbell family. Denny and Susan Campbell that are dear friends of ours to this day. Um, they have six children and they have four boys and, and two girls and the, and the, and the two gals might, might've been the toughest and had they, <laughs> had they wrestled, um, you know, had they had the opportunity back then, they, who knows what they would have been, but, but each of the sons was state champions, um, Two of them were four-time state champs. The two younger sons were Matt Campbell. So Tom is the oldest, and then Fritz, and then Matt and TJ. And Matt and TJ were both um, four-time state champs. And so uh, they were like the fifth and sixth state champs in four-timers in Montana history, and I became the seventh. And they were like older brothers to me, and TJ especially – he was five years older than I am and uh, just an older brother figure. And along with them was this other gentleman, Floyd Bond. And Floyd was uh, originally from Michigan, but had wrestled on the senior level and, uh, and then was in Montana teaching school. And he got connected with the Campbell family. And so then when I was getting started, I got connected with all of them. 
And, and then they're just have become my own family, you know, for Mike and I, and, and my parents and, and my, my sisters too, you know, they're just, um, so through the Campbell family and Floyd and, and these guys, um, that's how I got connected with Mark Sprague and his family. And so Mark, uh, senior and his wife, Alfie, um, they have, uh, let's see, they got five kids, right? So they got uh, three daughters. and Oh, no, they got they have six. They have four daughters and two sons. So they have six kids also, but kind of the reverse of the Campbell family. But one of their one of their sons, um, their oldest son, Marky, uh, Mark Jr., and Matt Campbell are the same age. And they're like two peas in a pod. They were like both little guys, both um, – just absolutely phenomenal talents and wrestlers. And, and so I'm, I'm going to, this, this brief little story that I can tell about coach Sprague, Mark Sprague, um, you know, all these gentlemen kind of became uh, second fathers to me, you know, and, and uh, Denny Campbell and, and Floyd even, and, and uh, some others, you know, Jabby Young and his family, um, Mark Sprague. So Mark never wrestled a match in his life. And as Marky was growing up, he got involved in wrestling and he, he lost a match. And then Mark senior, of course, became the, just a stereotypical monster parent and just vowed, you know, basically I've heard him tell this story probably 30 times and never once has he not cried telling the story. Cause it, that's how, you know, impactful. And even now he's, you know, in his late seventies, he's still coaching. He still does an amazing job. Um, Why does he cry it, about it? Well, I think because of uh, the, the monster parent factor, right? He, the, the, the problem, the, the negative about the monster parent or the monster coach is that it works, but it works only short term. And, and he found that out and it drove him to, you know, be obsessive and really, you know, I think it hurt the relationship. The way he tells the story, obviously I wasn't around at that those times, but that it damaged the relationship that he had with his own son. And and if you can't get through this thing and, and your son or your daughter or your your child be your your best friend, you know, um at the same time, then then maybe you're doing it wrong. And so I think that struggle really changed his perspective. And when I came around, um, I think he had already changed. He already realized that and had made adjustments. And, and you know, I know he has a strong relationship with his children, but it's an ongoing process, right? And I think I was, me and hundreds of other kids were the benefactors of that misstep and and what I would say about Mark Sprague is that he, I've never met a more loving, caring person as far as the people he interacts with and not just about the wrestling. He's, he's super passionate about the sport of wrestling and he's very analytical. He's, he's a visionary, um, you know, he's a really good businessman was very successful in the business world and several different ventures. You know, he owned a Marina in Portland, Oregon. He, he had a health club and that, that's kind of where he ra uh, ran the USA Oregon was the name of the health club. And then the Cobras, you know, it was USA Oregon was really the thing. And the S was the Cobra. And then later it just became the Cobras, but really innovative, like marketing mind. Right. So he, he had custom made like warm up outfits and singlets. He was the first person that I know of, um, that was using spandex, lycra, singlets, you know, shiny fabric and, you know, fitted stuff. And so, you know, back when I was wrestling in starting in those days, it was like, you wore a, a low cut, you know, low on the sides and high in the thigh. So it was like, you know, <laughs> it's about that wide on the side. Right. And you wore these singlets and, and then they were reversible, right. They're cotton singlet. And if you were really cool, you might've gotten, an old school wool singlet from Europe that, you know, 
the iron, all these countries behind the Iron Curtain in the former Soviet republics and whatever wore these wool singlets. And some of them even had a button, like they had one <laughs> strap, you know, kind of looked like a Tarzan suit. And then the other strap would button over your shoulder kind of deal. And that was like, that was, a, that was extremely exotic. But Mark was the first guy and an innovative guy that was really putting together a really cool uniform. And if you went to this camp, that was an invite only thing you got you know i mean it was expensive you had to pay whatever you pay to get but you got this uniform and so i was at denny campbell's camp it was in haver montana which is we call it the high line up north right next to the canadian border it's windy and cold and and uh and denny is just a tough person he just he, he's a remarkable individual but so his camp was called Campbell's Junkyard Dogs. And I was at that camp. And because they had the connection with Mark Sprague, you know, I think Floyd, you know, kind of had his feelers out and he saw something in me and asked me, hey, if you uh, had a chance to go to USA, Oregon, would you go? And I was like, heck yeah. And it was because I wanted the singlet, you know, I wanted you. <laughs> I, I didn't care about the wrestling. I just wanted right. that uniform. And, uh, and so... I started, I, you know, he must have talked to Mr. Sprague and, and they extended the invitation to me. And so I started going, I was eight years old the first year I went to the camp. And, and then I went every year, it was a two week long camp and the camp was, you know, it was really good. It was intense and tough, but it was innovative. And, and I mean, you know, we did, we did one hour sessions with like a five or 10 minute break. And it basically started at 7 a.m. and ended at 6 p.m. Whoa. <laughs> and then you had like, we had like an hour and a half for lunch, you know? So, but all morning, the morning you'd go in and warm up and run around and, you know, that took 45 minutes or an hour. And then we would do good news and everybody would, it wasn't mandatory, but a few guys would run out there and share good news. And, and then you would do, you would do two Greco technique sessions and a conditioning session. So one group would go out and run. The other one would be in one of the rooms doing technique. There was two wrestling rooms. So there'd be one in one group, one in another. Then they reverse. You do the other session. Then the third one, you'd go run and, you know, so you'd kind of rotate out. And then the last hour of the morning, you would do, you we'd wrestle live. Then, we, oh. then, then we'd take a break. And then, uh, We'd come back from uh, lunch and the first 30 minutes we did this, uh, we did this mental program that was called making of a champion. And it was all about just, you know, motivational stuff and goal setting and overcoming adversity and, you know, Zig Ziglar, Zig Ziglar music, yeah. stuff like that. I mean, really innovative and really light years ahead of his time as far as, um, introducing people to successful formulas. Not didn't matter if it was wrestling or if it was another sport or whatever it was. And but like I said, he was an innovative guy and he was innovative technically. I mean, he really studied it and uh, and he wanted to be successful and he wanted to give the kids that came through that program. He wanted to give them the tools to go on and and do things and. And because of that, and because you knew he cared about you, um, you had a ton of confidence. And, you know, I, I know some of my best friends, um, you know, Joe, that's Joe's club. That's where Joe Russell came from. Um, that's where Matt Lindland came from. That's where Oscar and Isaac Wood came from. That's where Anthony Amato trained. I mean, you know, in like the eighties and nineties, it was like the who's who of wrestling. And, uh, and even when I was going there, as campers, you know, you had like, um, just the who's who from around the country, you know, mm -hmm. I, I remember being there as a young kid and I, it's funny cause at about at the ballpark this past year, we're down on the field and the teams are wrestling. It's kind of, we were done and the college dual meet still was going on and I'm standing there and, and I bump into Chris Barnes, you know, mm -hmm. home state NCAA champion, 177 pounder, and I don't, you're, I don't know. Corey how, Bays, remember? Yeah. So Chris Barnes was at this camp. Corey Bays was at this camp. Kendall Cross was at this camp. 
I mean, there was like this Oklahoma wow. connection, right? So like there was really some stars around this program, you know. Um, now, when you guys were out there, were you aware of the Peninsula Park rivalry with Cobra oh yeah. USA? Yeah, yeah. They would come over and we would train together. So did you ever get your hands on Bobby Janice? Yeah, I used to wrestle with Bobby. Yep. What yeah, kind he, of a... He and, I were of about a... Same, he and I were about the same size, and uh, he was a year older than me. And then I had a, a friend from my hometown, uh, Bobby Young, who's his father, Jabby, and his his mother, Janie. So Jabby and Janie are uh, a couple that have become really good friends of ours. They had three boys that wrestled um, same times as Mike and I. So Bobby was a year older than me, then Dustin, then Jesse. Jesse was two years older than my brother, Mike. So we all were on the circuit together. Mm -hmm. And Bobby Young and Bobby Janice both went to Arizona State together. Yeah. And then after, um, you know, Bobby Janice's passing, Bobby Young left. They were actually pretty close friends on the team down there, and it was a pretty hard situation for him. So, but what yeah. Kind of, what kind of yeah. a talent was Bobby Janice back in high school? He was a freak. He was, <laughs> yeah, he was good. Yeah. 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 So the, there was like, uh, um, the Naradkas, Dave and Glenn Naradka, they're, they are a year older than me. They're Peninsula Park guys. Um, Bobby Janice, um, myself. I'm really good friends with Oscar Wood, who, but Oscar was a little bit younger than us. He wouldn't have been probably wrestling in the same groups of like shark bait and stuff like that. There's another guy named Dan Vidlack. Who's little, he's Cuban descent, but Dan Vidlak was like, he's probably four, maybe four or five years older than us, but he's a little guy. So we'd get to wrestle with him. But I mean, he was just like, I'm like, how do people get this strong? <laughs> I'm never going to get to be that strong. And so sometimes that was like our group, right? We'd be, we would do live wrestling and shark bait and it would be like the Naradkas and Bobby Janice and myself and, um a couple wow. of guys and yeah bobby was uh yeah he was he was great he was he was phenomenal he was he was as good as everybody says he was yeah i mean then you also had joe russell i mean like so like this this era is it's a great era for wrestling coming in and the less gutches of course yeah um and those yeah. portland state teams won division two nationals all the time yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, Dan, Joe's brother, right, went to Portland State. And he was the last when they changed that rule that allowed the, you know, if mm -hmm. you were, I don't know if they allowed NAIA, but I know they let the D3 guys go to D2s and D2s up to D1s if you won the Nationals, right? You could. And, uh, but Dan at Portland State was the last D2 athlete that was allowed to wrestle D1s. And, and uh yeah i mean phenomenal wrestler right phenomenal um program and, and all of that was uh mark sprague's um that's his his brainchild right and and his you know his two boys were great wrestlers marky the older one and then matt the younger one we used to call matt digger um and a lot of a lot of us i i don't i haven't talked to matt in a while but when my father passed away two years ago matt came um to pay his respects and, and, and I see him on, you know, social yeah. media and stuff like that. But a lot of us from that area st era still call him digger. And that's another conversation for another time. But so you mentioned something really interesting that Mark Sprague, the founder, owner, creator of Cobra, his son, Marky, you know, was a, you know, real technician, kind of like a, he was like a taskmaster and a damages relationship. When you look at you and your father, your father was very hard on you. Were you guys bordering on that, or did you? How did you guys maintain oh, a good balance? You know, I I think yeah, my dad was he was uh, he was tough, no doubt, and he pushed. But I think, uh, and I can't speak for for Mr. Sprague and Marky because I wasn't in the relationship. I've just heard the story, right? Right. And, and I know Mark Jr. Um, you know, he's quite a bit older than I am, but been around him and, and, and he's a great guy, phenomenal guy. Um, and, and, you know, statistically he was like, he's a freak, right? He was like yeah. a seven time age group world champion. I think they <laughs> lied about his age a couple of times to get him into the schoolboy world. I mean, 
but the thing with when our father for Mike and I is that um, I never questioned if my father loved me. You know, and I'm, I'm not saying that Mark and Marky did. I'm just saying for me, that's what carried me through the tough stuff, right? When, you know, I mean, we kind of expected to win everything every time, always. And so when you didn't, it was kind of, it was hard, you know, and, and it, unfortunately there wasn't a whole lot of that, but, but, you know, there's tough stuff to, to get to that level of expectation. There's tough stuff, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you don't love it, um, it's going to be really hard, right? It, it's, you, you can't, I mean, it's shaped, it certainly has shaped my philosophy as a national coach. And it certainly did. Um, these experiences and things shaped my philosophy about developmental wrestling for sure. Cause there was a lot of great things and how do you, how do you accumulate the collection of great things and push those forward in the best possible way while still fostering the most positive attitude or um, self-reflection within the sport. You know, I think a lot of times because our sport's hard, um, how we introduce athletes to the sport of wrestling, um, you know, we, we have a, I, I learned this on the, on the business side of things once I started working here is that, you know, USA wrestling. Uh, well, I think we've addressed some of these issues and that's why we're growing at, at a very good rate. We, we annually set membership records because we tried to do some things to address these, but we early on, we had a terrible attrition rate, right? We'd lose 30 to 40% of our membership each year. And so there was wow. some mar market research done you know, um, Rich and Les when Les came in and from his business background and analyzed why these things are. And it's the same things that we all know, right? Well, you know, there's, you have two six-year-olds or let's say you have two 12-year-olds and one's been wrestling for six years and the other one's a far better athlete, but he just started and there's really no contest, right? Because mm -hmm. we have a a technically deep um, sport and, and that kid just doesn't have a chance to catch up. And then competitions are really long, right? It takes all day, you know? So this 12 year old goes to one competition and he gets his butt whipped and it takes all day for that to happen. And it blows the whole family weekend. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, th those are kind of symptoms of what I think we saw, you know, in years ago when you had this, you had great work ethic and great toughness, um, but it just needed some balance. Yeah. I think for us, you know, it's a struggle, right? You, you kind of cross the lines each direction to find find where that center is. And I know for my brother and I, um, we had different paths, you know, through the sport. and But we had the same information. We had the same parents. We had, and, and talking about it, um, you know, it was – when somebody's switch kind of flips on can be a different time of, of their life. And, and us knowing that our parents loved us unconditionally and that was the most important thing. And so, mm -hmm. well, you know, some of us turn on earlier and some of us turn on later. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that relationship um, is the, the parent approval of their, of their child is, is the biggest, most important um, relationship in a kid's life. And, and, you know, I was, I was really um, pleased to hear uh, several years ago, probably five, six years ago, when I was a developmental coach, I heard Kale um, speak about it. And, and he's obviously experienced some tremendous pressures in his career, you know, maybe not from his parents, but, you know, just, mm -hmm through what he's accomplished and understands those things that like, you know, if a, if a athlete or um, child is, is doing something that they think is vying for their parents' approval and their parents' love, man, it's, that's a huge burden, mm -hmm. huge burden. And so yeah. anyways, it's interesting. 
No, no. It's interesting because we, when I was growing up, I grew up in the Quad Cities. And yeah. I was in middle school when the season came out, the ESPN show. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And yeah, your parents yeah, were that. stars of that show. I, I'll never forget yeah. your dad's um, dealership, and they had the rope in the middle of it. Yeah. It, so is that that's all true? You guys were doing that early age, yeah, climbing I, the rope? Oh, yeah. I climbed that rope. I mean, by the time I graduated high school, I probably climbed that rope several thousand times i mean i climbed it 10 times a day pretty much every day so i mean like maybe morning not, or after practice not, or no after school i'd 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 come i'd go there i mean that dealership was like a second home to to us i'd go after school i'd go over there hit the rope 10 times hang around you know screw off drive the golf cart around the dealership and try to try to ramp it off a jump you know we'd take a piece of plywood and lay it over a railroad try and try to you know jump this thing off this ramp and you know never, <laughs> never had enough uh torque to get over. we'd get high centered on the top you know but yeah we, yeah we we climbed that rope a lot and then when mike uh when mike you know got to i don't know when he started doing it i don't know when i started doing it but yeah we climbed it a lot and there's so many stories we're not going to be able to hit on. Like the one summer you guys put 26,000 miles on your van in like six weeks and, you know, like Gable coming to town. Awesome. But I want to get to Iowa because yeah. you get to Iowa and there's some hammers in the lineup. I mean, absolute studs. So when you were a true freshman, like who were the starters at the 34, the 42, the 49, that era? Yeah. So our lineup, um, that was a year if, you know, if you saw the poster that says, um everybody was standing you saw the backs of them it says and we're all back we they had 10 returning all americans and uh there wasn't 10 in the lineup but terry steiner had beat out an all-american to make the team so there was 10 returning so it was uh the starting 10 was uh chad zapital terry brands tom brands troy steiner terry steiner uh tom ryan mark ryland travis Pfizer. Uh, uh, excuse me, Bart Chelsvig, then Travis Pfizer, and then John Osendorp. And so, Doug Stryker was out. <laughs> Doug, Doug Stryker was an All-American, and Terry had uh, had beat him out for the spot, and then Terry became an All-American. And, and uh, yeah, Doug and his brother Kent were on the team, his younger brother, Kent. Um, I actually lost a wrestle off to Kent, or lost a match, not a wrestle off a match in an open tournament my true freshman year. But, yeah, I mean, it was a great room. It was like, and then, you know, uh, Coach Cable was our head coach, Jim Zaleski, Barry Davis, um, and uh, Royce was our strength strength coach at the time, you know, and then, yeah, that was, so we were, that was our, yeah, it was remarkable, you know. It, obviously, I wasn't at Iowa in other eras and other periods, and, and Gable's tenure as the head coach, there were, you know, several different groups and mm -hmm. cycles, but, you know, after they lost going for the 10th in a row and then Gable rebuilt the program, the year I came in was the year after they won the first title back. Yeah. And so I, I've kind of speculated that I might've come through that program in one of the best times to ever come through, you know, Easily. just because of, Gable revamped his philosophy and it was a different. Um, it still fit within his intensity and his work ethic and all these other good things. But um, yeah, we, we had some great people around. And then after me, there was a bunch of other great athletes. You know, my class was probably me and Daryl Weber were the two standouts, but there was other Iowa homegrown kids like Matt Dickey, who was a great wrestler. And then, you know, uh, the year after us was, uh, Lincoln McAravey came in and Lincoln and I had known each other from uh, youth wrestling and, so, you know, being a kid in the West and the South Dakota and Montana. And, and then, you know, Joe, uh, Joe Williams and, and uh, yeah, just, it was a great Oof. time. Right? And you're so, touching on like that early nineties, eighties era with the brands of the Steiners and all those animals. Then you're also getting, kind of like that mid nineties, the, the great Lincoln McGravy, Joe Williams. I mean, Mark Ironside, I mean, some Ironside, of the, yeah. Mena, I mean, like, yeah. I, I just, I love those teams. Now, when you were there, who was your like pack that you were on with? Were you hanging out with the Steiners? I mean, who was, who were some of your guys? Yeah. I, I kind of hung out with 
I, I mean, I guess I hung out with all of them, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, early on, um, you know, in the room, I remember wrestling, you know, like you always kind of like had this idea that you just pick the toughest guy every day. Right. <laughs> so, um, a week for me as a freshman was like Tom Brands, Terry Brands, Chad Zappel, Troy Steiner, Terry Steiner, you know, like, right. I might rotate through those guys every day. And in a minute, I mean, man, that's a, that's a tough road to hoe for, you know, I, I think, you know, I feel like my freshman year, maybe first semester, I hardly scored many takedowns. Right. And you're like feeling like, well, I was pretty good. You know, I was, four times state champ and national champ and all these other things. And now I'm in a room where you're not hardly scoring many points. Right. And, uh, it, it took, you know, it kind of makes you reevaluate things. And for a while I thought I didn't even know how to wrestle, but why do you I, say that? Well, you know, you just, you're not, you're not getting the, the positive reinforcement in the room. Right. <laughs> and I realized, well, maybe I don't need to wrestle a national champ every day at practice. Maybe I can, you know, and, and I kind of, I kind of learned that, right. I learned how to train. I learned how to train myself. That was, that was one of the things that Gable, um, I was probably not very independent because I, I had, I had great leadership, but, um, I just kind of did whatever my father said, you know, and I always wanted to do it. And so it was easy, but stepping out on your own, most kids have to make that adjustment when they go to college. But um, something that Gable talked about was being independent in knowing what to do. You know what to do. You don't need me standing there to tell you to do it. You just need to have the discipline to go to make that right choice. And so that was something that I really benefited from his leadership um in that time and 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 I also saw him coach the team differently each year so that year that team he was really um a loosely structured program you know a lot of times he would say um okay warm up and get started on your own and I'll jump in at the end and he would never jump in at the end so what you would do is you'd you'd warm up and drill with your you know, get your own warm up. You drill until you're ready to wrestle live, and then you'd wrestle live. And you, you know, there was kind of this standing. Um, it was really an unspoken rule. I, I don't ever remember Gable ever saying this, um, but everybody in the room knew it. It was like, well, you take a break when your partner wants to take a break. I'm not going to take the break. He's going <laughs> to take the break. And so when you got a room full of guys like that, nobody's taking the break, right? So, you know, um, so, you know, you you would go out and wrestle 20, 30 minute, 45 minute goes. Sometimes I remember, you know, junior and senior years when Lincoln and I would wrestle quite a bit. Well, we would wrestle and it would be like, we'd have to notify each other like two weeks out. Cause you'd have to mentally get prepared for a workout like that. Everyone right? from those teams say that they go, this was something where you'd line up partners days in advance. Yeah. And, and a lot of times you just go in the day of and be like, Hey, you want to go? Yeah. Okay. But then as you got older, you got a little smarter too. And you knew like, this is okay. If, if Lincoln and I are going to wrestle today, it's going to be an hour and 20 minute go. Nobody's <laughs> going to take a break, you know? So and he liked to drill a lot. I liked to drill a lot. So we would probably warm up for 30 to 40 minutes and then wrestle. It, it was funny because you'd wrestle a, a practice. You'd wrestle maybe an hour and 10 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes. I, the reason I say hour and 20, I remember one particular day where Lincoln and I wrestled an hour and 20 minutes straight. And then at the end of the go, we're both pretty exhausted, right? And he's not admitting to taking the break and neither am I. So he walked off his way and I kind of walked off my way and we both kind of look over each other's shoulder and you kind of blame it on the other guy. Well, he must want a break. So I'm going <laughs> to, you know, it's kind of one of them. Yeah. Deals, right? And uh, so when, when, when you're older, I guess, well, older meaning like upperclassmen, you know, junior, senior year, you've been through that for three years. You, you got to get mentally ready for that. 
you know, like, okay, hey, Lincoln, you want to wrestle? Yeah, um, let's go next Tuesday. Okay, great. You know, we got this dual meet, we got whatever. And I we needed, you know, you learn that when you need those challenges and when you don't need those challenges and, mm -hmm. and you know. And so when you're like drilling like that, like Coach Gable or Zaleski, those guys aren't really around. It's just kind of like, Oh no, they're, they're 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 there and they're they're coaching and they're giving input. They might pull you over and say, "Hey, Zadik, you know, um, why don't you adjust this lock right here? Or you need to be a little higher on the leg, or or not, right?" And so, with a program like that, and kind of what I was getting to with Coach Gable is, man, you, I mean, look at all those names. They're all, you know, they all have become leaders in the sport, right, in different eras. Um, you know, Chad Zappel, um he grew up in the construction. His father was a contractor. He started a construction business in Iowa city. Then he moved, he was doing some stuff in wrestling in MMA. Um, Tom and Terry brands, obviously head coaches, Troy Steiner, Terry Steiner, Tom Ryan, all head coaches. Uh, Mark Ryland was a state leader in Iowa forever. Um, his impact on our sport. Um, Travis Pfizer, the head coach at Grundy forever. Um, Shout out to my man Ostendorf at Co. Love yeah. Coach O. Ozzy, um, yeah, and and he's a head coach at Co. and and uh, and Bart, you know, Chelsvig has coached at a high level, right? He was at Wisconsin for a while, and he's he's moved around in different jobs. So all of those guys were leaders. And so, what I love about Gable is that he did stuff unique to each person. Like the year Lincoln came out of redshirt, and he lost his first one, and there was like kind of like everyone's up in arms, and so. Gable does the mock dual meets where he, you know, brings in the, the crowd and all that. I mean, you were right in the thick of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I got beat off the team. See, I mean, that's probably, I wasn't carrying my weight that freshman year and that's why Lincoln got pulled. Really? Yeah. So you were, okay. So you were in the lineup. I was, I was a 34 pounder. Troy Steiner was the defending national champion at 142 and he moved down and beat me out so they could pull Lincoln. So oh, yeah, wow, I mean, yeah, truly totally. memory for me, but man, powerful lesson, powerful lesson. Yeah, Gable was um a master mind at you know, and, and that's that was really his hallmark is he figured people out mm -hmm. and he figured out what made them tick and he coached them each individually, but it still fit within his philosophy, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. Was it like, you know, like Ray Brinzer, when Ray Brinzer transferred to Iowa, um, he's a little bit unique and a little eccentric, but, but Gable found a way to make him successful. You know, the year he wrestled at Iowa, um, my junior, his senior year, he was zero and zero going into the big 10 tournament and he wins the big 10 tournament was third at the nationals. I think he lost to Kevin Randleman in a, in a really tight match. Wow. You know, but like, how, how does, how do you make that work? Right. Like Gable had to find a way and he did obviously to find a way to, to make Ray successful within that fit within Gable's philosophy. Yeah. And, you know, eventually your senior year, you, you're a two-time All-American, you're national champ, 96, a, a team champion as well. But I, I heard an interview you said where, like, the week afterwards, you're a little bit down on yourself that it didn't change your life, quote-unquote. Like, talk us through kind of like this self-reflection you had after you won the Nationals and, and kind of getting a deeper meaning. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, you know, when I graduated high school, I thought I was going to be a four-time national champ. And I, I think um, I could have been, I just, I didn't do the right things. Right. I didn't, I think I had the ability. I think I had the the skills even. Um, and I certainly learned a lot more, but um, I, so I finally, I finally win. Right. I was, I, I got hurt pretty seriously my junior year and, and, you know, my sophomore year, I was, I was, wrestling really well and and had a pretty good streak going and then I was ineligible and then my junior year Gable moved me up to 42 and um you know I kind of took some lumps during the year but I was really kind of hitting a hitting a stride and and uh I got I 
hurt in the Big Ten finals. And so then that, you know, was a big setback. And, you know, um, I ended up being an All-American, but that certainly wasn't what I wanted Mm -hmm. out of those tournaments. And so finally winning felt like getting the monkey off my back, you know, like, okay, I I won this thing. And, you know, um, but it didn't like revolutionize my life you know, that in the way that I thought it might. Right. And, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's more of a faith, um, my own personal faith journey than, than really a wrestling thing. Um, but when, when I didn't, when I, when I, when I won and then it didn't revolutionize my life and, you know, I, nobody delivered me a mansion and a new truck and, you know, (laughs) a supermodel and all that kind of stuff, right? Right. You know, the material things that people think about. Um I was I was already having kind of deeper questions about the meaning of life. And and uh so yeah, it was uh that like that was another huge wake up call. Like, okay, no, this th- this thing doesn't change on its own. Um if it's gonna change, you're gonna have to change it. Right. If you if you want this if you want this peace and joy about life, and that's really what I was trying to find. Um, I just didn't know what it, what the components were. And at that same time, um, yeah, I was, you know, God, uh, you know, I'm a believer. And so I, I, I just, the longer I live, the less I believe in coincidence and God was putting the right people in my path to, you know, he was, he was reaching out for me and, you know, Ken Klingman's one of those people. Coach Gable was certainly one of those people. My parents, the biggest people, because they were great leaders from a spiritual perspective in our own home. Um, but in that part of my journey, you know, Coach Gable um, got me linked with John Peterson, John Evan Peterson. And so then I started doing some national team tours. And, and, and John, I think, recognized a hunger in me for some answers and then he came down to visit and kind of just laid it out for me he's like hey well you know what do, what do you think here if if you died today would you go to heaven and and i'm thinking like oh yeah maybe i th- i think i'm pretty good you know i got i'm thinking on the scales of justice well my good stuff outweighs my bad stuff maybe <laughs> maybe you know <laughs> Now I know that, you know, it's no, not even close, right? Not even close. My, my bad, I'm, my good is never going to outweigh my bad. And uh, so that was, you know, but I guess, you know, that's the lessons you learn in both, in, in both setback and success is like, we've learned that same lesson, winning, winning a team title for, you know, which is way more personally rewarding to, to win um, because it takes so many people, not only the 10 athletes, but it takes like, I mean, we're talking like 70 people mm-hmm. through the summer to have the same culture of thought and to all be pulling on the rope on the same end or pushing the bus from, you know, the same direction. And, um, so those, those rewards of being able to do that together are so powerful. Yeah. But you don't know that until you have success, right? And <laughs> you don't have it. You're looking at it like, oh man, the grass is always greener, right? Well, if I won this, I'd have a better job and more money and a nicer house and all this stuff that it really doesn't matter. Right. It really doesn't matter. And that's a big turning point for you. Ultimately, fast forward eight years later, you retire at University of Iowa and you head to Colorado Springs. And yeah. What was it about KJ that brought you out there? Um, well, kind of kind of similar things. Um, you know, struggling through my international career and feeling like I was capable but not getting the results that I wanted. And I needed to put myself in an environment where I could do exactly what I felt like were the right things. And what I knew about Kevin, um was that he was an intense competitor and I loved his, um, his enthusiasm and, and he just, um, and now knowing him as well as I know him, um, you you just see that, right. You see that it's, it's his personality, it's his character. 
and he's a man of faith too. And, and, and we've all had our own journeys to, to get to where God has us. But that's what I recognize about Kevin is I knew Kevin, um, he wanted us to win. He wanted the United States to win. He wanted me personally to win. And, and, and I loved his good, positive energy. You just feel great hanging around KJ. Like you just, yeah. it's amazing. Yes. You know, yes. um, I was with him on Friday for this project. And, uh, so, you know, two, two hours with him and I'm coming out of there calling my brother. I'm like, man, you just feel good being around KJ and just everyone, you know, it's just so exciting. And, uh, so you come out there at first, Sergey's your coach. What, what's something you picked up from Sergey that was totally new to you? Cause coming from Iowa, you had pretty much had the same medicine from like the early nineties up until that point. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was interesting. Um, I was, I was a little, you know, a little long in the tooth when I got, when I got here. Right. So I think Sergey's impression of me was that I was a little bit over the hill. Yeah. And, um, I don't think he wanted to waste a bunch of time and, you know, um, but what I did learn, you know, I, I mean, I, I had actually, he'd come to Montana when I was in high school and had done a, done the Montana state high school association clinic. And I was, I was part of that. So I was like super excited, of course, knew who he was and his reputation. But when I moved out here, I was like, Oh, I can't wait to just dig into technique and pick his brain and learn things. And, and so that was fun for me. Um, but I think another thing that I learned from him was that you don't have to kill yourself every single day in order to find success. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was hard. That was really hard for me to swallow at first, you know, cause I had this, I mean, that was my own, you know, my own nature before getting to Iowa, right? That's how we did it growing up in Montana. That's how my father and I did it. You, you pick the toughest guy or you did the hardest thing, or you challenge yourself, you know, to the limit every single day to expand that boundary. And there's a lot of value in that, but there's also um, a time and place for knowing who you are and what you are and, and not, you know, wearing it out and, in so that was a, a big thing that I learned from him was, you know, it was okay for me to go in the room and sp spend 30, 45 minutes or an hour and a half, the whole practice, whatever, doing something at level six instead of level 10. Mm -hmm. And I still, um, I still got better that day or improved, you know? And so that was a big thing I learned from him. Let's yeah. just kind of lay the grounds. Like, why do people say that the world's is tougher than the Olympics? Well, first off, it's a bigger bracket, right? The Olympics, you know, now it's a 16 athlete bracket. Um, at that time, I think it was 19 or 21 because they, you know, there was basically 19 or 20 qualifiers. And then they have these Olympic solidarity spots that are, you know, given away as kind of quote unquote wild cards, so to speak. But um so it's a reduced pool, right? And so when you go to the world championships, I think I think in 06, I think my bracket was 48. Right. So you could you could have, you know, Whoa. five or six matches in 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 you know in a two-day format now, but uh, back then it was a one day format. And I had I had five matches um in six. And so yeah, and it, and in those days there was no seating, right? This this ranking point system that's been created is a good thing. I think it's healthy for our sport. But back then, I mean, you could have a, a random draw. You know, you could have top four guys from last year in the same quarter bracket, right? And and uh, you know, somebody looks like they're walking to the finals on the other side, and these guys are battling it out like it. Mm -hmm. you know, so it can be. Yeah, I think that's why, you know, there's that 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 thought process that world championships, it's it's tough, right? It's tough. And what if like, you know, I always kind of put it in this context. If you're talking to someone who's like 
big into jujitsu and they know nothing about wrestling, how would you describe the importance of the world championships in a non-Olympic year? Um, yeah, it's uh, super important, right? It's, it's, it's the same thing, right? It's the pinnacle of our sport. Um, obviously, you know, the Olympic games, there's a lot more prestige in, in, in even money and, in importance put on it. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't totally say that the world championships is harder. I would say that it can be, but that there's, you know, there's things that the Olympics has that the world championships doesn't added pressures, prestige, fame, money, all these other things too. Right. But I mean, it's the pinnacle of the sport. It's, it's the Olympic games in the non-Olympic year. It's, it's, you know, every guy in the bracket, every athlete in the bracket is the national champion from their country. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a hefty thing. And, and, in, and in combatives world, I mean, you know, you're refining, you know, all the toughest people in the planet down to 10 spots. Who are those 10 people? Well, that's a pretty limited pool of folks. Especially in the year before the Olympics. Year before the Olympics, Olympic it's Olympic qualification, which adds another level of significance. And we're, you know, we're we're heading into that year right now as we speak, right? 2023. Um let's go. Yeah, let's it's go. Exciting, man. Got it's it. Very exciting. It's very exciting. It's that's important stuff. And so, you know, uh the qualification was similar then, you know, the world championship the year prior was uh was a big qualifier for the Olympic Games. So um yeah, people get geared up a, even a little more for those things, right? Yeah, definitely. And I just want to ask you about one thing, then we'll let you go. Kind of going back to Terry's arrival, and you know, I know you were no stranger to him, but like what were some of like the rules and standards that Terry implemented that weren't at the OTC or the resident program before that? Yeah. Um I, you know, I, I think what you're getting at is we had a, uh, a, a, a late fee, right? And so it was like, it was kind of a colloquial, like, okay, if you guys are going to show up late for practice, I'm going to charge you. I'm going to charge you $20 a minute for every. So if you're late three minutes, that's 60 bucks, right? And and I don't know that he was really charging everybody. Right. I don't, I don't think so, to be honest. I, but I think it was a standard, right? You're trying to change culture and you, you got to create standards. And and so, you know, I, I think. So yeah, Terry implemented that or. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was when Terry was here. And I mean, it was fun. You know, I, I got I, I paid out on it. I know, you know, and it went into the community. It went into our team fund. Right. It paid for. You know, I probably paid Henry's entry fee to the U.S. Open one year, or some, <laughs> some silly thing like that. Because, you know, um, but I didn't. What pay the, I didn't. What other? What other stuff was Terry a like, stickler for? Just standards, you know, just what he felt were right things, you know, what what he wanted in the program, and uh, yeah, um, if he thought it was the right thing to do, you know being on time to practice was a big one, but any, anything, any, you know, anything that is a moral, um, or, or ethical or, or program goal, um, there's, there's gotta be some accountability to that. Right. And, um, anybody that leads a program, um, we, we have to have those things and they may not be the same for everybody, but you know, they're, for the most part, they're good things. Yeah. And so he was big on that. And then do, last thing I was going to ask you is, do you remember like any workouts in particular with Terry, whether it's running the cog or anything like that, that really stick out as when his tenure there? Um, Not anything specific. I mean, we did a lot of tough stuff, you know, <laughs> and everybody does, right? Uh, everybody's doing it right now. So, um, you know, I would say we were, the thing that we were during that time is we were very consistent, you know, and, and I think that's, that's a, that's a hallmark to anyone's success wherever in whatever sport, you know, if we're talking about the all blacks and rugby, or you're talking about 
Penn State in wrestling right now, or you're talking about our program or, you know, Alabama football, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. consistency wins. And, and, uh, and we, we were definitely that we, you know, um, there, there was a lot of hard work, but there always is, you know, anybody that's winning is doing hard work. And, and that is consistent too. You know, it's not an anomaly. You don't just, you, you don't cram for the test, right? It's a slow build over a long period of time and you build into things that, um, that you can handle and you can deal with and you, you make yourself better. you literally force yourself to be better. Well, coach Zadig, it's been so much fun. I know we've gone way over time. Any last words before we let you go here, sir? Hey, no, man, you're uh appreciate you having me on. I, I love what you do. It's, it's a, it's a great thing for our sport to have these conversations and, and you're telling some great stories. So keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Go USA. Amen. All right. Take care, coach.